Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Doug Pauley with Central Community College in Columbus, Nebraska. I'm the PI and I'm also the project, our Director of Training and Development for our community college. My primary job is working with business and industry and customizing training programs that meet their needs. We have full-time trainers that work with those businesses. And one of the things about Nebraska is we have an unemployment rate of about 4%. And so we're always looking for skilled people. One of the things that we are doing is trying to build our pipeline and work with high school teachers a lot more so that we can build that pipeline. This project really, um, Project Shine really evolves around that, where we are working with high school and middle school teachers, and we are setting them up with a business mentor where they are working with a business contact for the course of the year, and so that they become more aware of what is really going on in business and industry, and then they can write curriculum based on those experiences that they have with their um, business mentor. Sure. We've, done, we've done this now for a few years. This is our going on the second year of our Project Shine. Um, it's going very well and we have a great team of people that are helping pull that together from the uni university, um, from our schools, and from our business and industry. And so now I'm going to have Dan Davichak. Dan is the project coordinator for this project and he's going to talk to you a little bit more about the project. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I, I understand at least one of you in here has to cut out pretty soon, so please um, um, leave the clicker that I handed to you on the table if you do need to leave, but the, the CD and the booklet are yours to keep. Um, we have actually uh, some lessons that we're going to demonstrate uh, based on more than one NSF project. We actually have uh, three, four NSF projects that w went into some of the lesson model things that we're going to, to talk about. And uh, they're not all ATE. We've got ATE with Project Shine, which is um, uh, why we're here. But then there's, uh, there's iTest and Discovery K-12 uh, with uh, the Silicon Prairie Institute for, or uh, the Silicon Prairie Institute for Robotics and Information Technology, which is uh, really a project that's partnered between the University of Nebraska at Omaha and the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, the College of Education at UNO, and the College of Engineering and so we have a number of things going on here and the lessons that you have in the CD that we've handed out um, that you'll take back with you are online on three different locations that we'll also discuss but also you have them on the CD and they're in a format that's easy to work with and they're in a Word document format so if you want to do anything with it um, please do so when you go back to your institution. I want to introduce the folks I've got the names up here Doug I'm uh, Dan Davichek, and I started out at the college with uh, the Mechatronics Education Center project that we had with the U.S. Department of Labor under their high growth uh, uh, grant. And we have some information about our mechatronics program here. If you're into or interested in that sort of thing, we have it at the back of the room. And um, I guess I'll let the other folks introduce themselves. Uh, and uh, in the back, we have, uh, go ahead, Liz. And we have, I didn't change that, um, Brian and uh, Brian Sandall. Uh, my name is Brian Sandall. I am a 7, uh, or a, a 912 math teacher at Westside Community Schools. I taught seventh grade too, not recently. Um, at, in Omaha, Nebraska, teach computer programming and work with Project Shine and the Spirit Project through the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And, and Paul Clark, Dr. Clark. Yep, Paul Clark. I'm Okay, now from uh, we did a pre-workshop workshop and, and Liz uh, did a bit of a presentation on and we got into a discussion on hard skills and soft skills and, and our speaker over uh, lunch also, lunch I, think, also talked, I think talked about that a little bit. But um, I'm going to uh, just reiterate a slide that we did show uh, in a previous presentation. It's kind of a recap 
But um, these are, uh, from our experience with business and industry in Nebraska that we work with through the, the different projects that we've had and, and the feedback we've had through uh, numerous anecdotal and qualitative surveys and discussions, um, we've got uh, soft skills in, in, in a somewhat of a non-scientific uh, order, but the top uh, soft skills that people from business and industry they're expecting out of, of the education system and the people that they're going to hire. And reliability was number one, followed by communication, professionalism, work ethic, and a lifelong learner. The hard skills that folks are looking for, the top one was measurement. Business and industry that we work with is, is pretty well varied. We're working with folks that are uh, uh, with, the, with the Project Shine grant in energy, biofuels, food processing, and manufacturing, we have uh, Fortune 500 companies. We have medical suppliers who are the world leader or amongst the world leaders in what they're doing. We have steel companies. We have ethanol producers. We have um, across the gamut of different folks who work with wind tower uh, manufacturers, um, public power energy industry where they use nuclear, hydro, wind, um, coal-fired power plants. And measurement was the number one thing they're looking for for hard skills from folks. Basic math, too. That's the number two. Now, that's not that big of a brainer, but I mean, think about it. When you go to a fast food restaurant or something, how many people actually are calculating what, and, and as opposed to uh, regurgitating what they see on a little computer screen? Um, and we have a math teacher that's co-PI um, in the project. And one of the things she mentioned is she says the kids are really pushing, they're, they're pushing the buttons and they're not thinking. The buttons are substituting. She uh, illustrated that by saying when she said, what's 437.2 times zero? So the kids whipped out their calculators and they started <laughs> doing <laughs> And And, you know, you know uh, we want to be able to engage these folks in some of the things we're doing. So that's kind of the point behind these lesson activities that we're working with. Everything we do is driven by standards because nobody can do anything without making sure it complies to uh, uh, some state or national standard for, for the STEM education. Number three, problem solving. Now the one with the calculator with the um, 43.7 times zero, that's, you know, not a good use of number three there. Okay, technical okay. writing, the ability to, uh, to practice and deploy written communication is pretty important. And analyzing data. Okay. So what we have now, and I make sure that everybody has them, but we have these uh, little clickers. And um, is there anybody in here who has not used uh, some sort of an audience response system before? You have not? <coughs> We've got a couple of questions that we're going to go through. And, and it's, my, it's my somewhat high-tech way, if you will, of uh, gathering just the basic information when they survey at the beginning of the discussion. But the nice thing is it puts it in a database, and, and, and it It'll present it in a chart, but I can put it in a lot of different ways. And this kind of information is really good. And um, I'm not going to try to sell Turning Point because, you know, if you like it, the, it's, the software is a free download, I guess. So who are we and how important is engaging business and education? Well, I've got a little poll. If you look up in the upper right corner up there, it says polling is open and you know, it shows responses. With your clicker, uh, push uh, one through six for whichever number corresponds to or who you represent and, and who you are. Does everybody have a clicker? Okay. And, you know, no big surprise, we have um, over half of you are from higher ed, and when you have nine people, you don't get a real wide distribution. But okay, the um, now that we've done that, the tech way, I guess I want to find out who, uh, by show of hands, who are the the two-year um, school folks? Okay, and who's the four-year person? Okay, and business and industry. Where are you from, man? 
great. Thank you. And other. And what is other, sir? I'm in the value Ah, very good. You know where I sit. You know, <laughs> I was going to put that on there, but <laughs> that would fit. OK, we're going to try a couple more. Um, and where are you from? This is, again, more of a practice question. Um, Yeah, I did forget the Southwest. Sorry about that. It was more of a practice question for the uh, the clicker. All right. Okay, gonna go ahead and close it out. Somebody held out on that one. Um, interestingly enough, it, there is a um, there's two there's two ways to run this thing. You can run it in a mode where you can identify who's got what clicker. Um, so you would know how people voted if that was a reason you wanted to know that. And you can do it anonymous. I don't really know what, who's got what, so don't worry about it if you're lying where you're from. <laughs> OK, the reason I'm here, Okay, we'll go ahead and close it out. You can put a timer on this too, but I didn't do that. Very well. Half of you are here for your NSF activity and evenly distributed between your school and to learn about STEM lesson ideas. Good. Partnership between business and education is important to the community. Now, I'm not going to vote on this because I don't want to skew you the numbers. The numbers. We did this uh, at a conference where we had 500 people attending, and we were able to do it, and it worked just great. We held a business education leader summit with our state uh, leadership, the governor, the commissioner of labor, commissioner of education, uh, economic development, and and business and industry leaders and, and education leaders. And these are some of the questions that we asked at that summit. And I'm curious the way that the results will <laughs> compare. Um, I would expect this kind of a result. And, and it wasn't quite that strong at the beginning when we did these questions with our, our Business Education Leader Summit. Whoop. I closed that one out. Sorry, guys. I'll go back and reset that one. Okay, it's open again. And obviously this is your from your perspective. Nice. Businesses are engaged in their local education programs. Thank you. Anybody else would like to contribute on this one? Okay, we'll go on. Interesting. You know, we're kind of representing the the, uh, the movers and the shakers of the business education engagement community, and there's a lot of skepticism there, so I think that's very telling. In fact, I would say um, um, that's even a point for discussion as we get later on. And I think we're not really going into that heavily as far as discussion goes, but uh, we're going to show some lessons that are designed to engage <laughs> teachers and students in getting people more aware of what's going out in different jobs. 
different careers. Education looks to business enough for guidance when, guidance cur when curriculum is being developed. Very well. Now that's kind of a contrast to the previous uh, slide, I think. And we talked about businesses are engaged in their local education programs, and half of you said you agree, not strongly agree, and the other half were non-committal or disagree. But when we talked about Education looks to business enough for guidance when curriculum is being developed. We uh, feel that education maybe is doing a little bit better job of being engaged than businesses. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of supposition out of seven or eight people making a survey. But the you know it, it's points for discussion, and certainly that's the kind of thing we want to try to do uh, when we're with our um, our business audience, especially. Business and education are responsible for developing common solutions to improve a community. Okay. Okay, um, I gotta ask, because we have three quarters of the folks agree, not so much strongly agree, that business and education should work together. Is it the reason that people don't feel more strongly about it? Um, what is that? Anybody? Uh, no room for it? Okay. That's a good, that's a good point. Kind of like the eighty twenty rule, uh, where you know eighty percent of your solution uh, is met. Uh, you know, 20 percent, well, I'm not going to say it right. Um, 80 percent of the people are served, um, and you spend more time on that 80 percent, and and that's where you would dedicate your time and resources as opposed to the 20. Um, now, the 20 that may have the money and the budget could, inf could influence that differently, though. So, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, the 80-20 rule in, in uh, sales might be 20% of your customers make 80% of your purchases. So maybe that doesn't really work well for this analogy. Or 20% of the problem children in a, in a classroom or problem students in a classroom um, create 80, take 80% 80 of your time. OK. At this point, we'll have a couple more questions at the, uh, at the end, follow up towards the end of our session. But uh, I, uh, I want to turn it over to Brian, and he's going to talk a little bit about the websites that we have that feature some of the lessons and show you where they are and if you would, would be interested in accessing them. And he's, yeah, also, and he's also going to talk a little bit about our interactive lesson model that we've used to design these lessons uh, as a consortium. I've got to find my PowerPoint here. I don't know what Dan did with it. I'll get it. There it is. Oh, that's his. All right, I put my uh, 
name and email address up here because if you want to get a hold of me about anything lesson related, I did notice that it's wrong in the uh, conference thing. There's an extra E in there. So this is my email address. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions about these websites. Um, if you don't get them copied down right and you want to take a look at them, shoot me an email and I'll give you a link to them so that you uh, get access to those. The lesson format that we have is a, a different format uh, than you probably have ever seen. It's the vowel format, A-E-I-O-U vowel format lesson. And I'm going to give you about five minutes overview of what that is. And then we're going to demonstrate three different lessons uh, that come from a couple different projects that use these lessons, lessons for integration of technology, robotics, businesses into the K-12 curriculum um, in schools. The AEIOU lesson component sorry, right sorry. here, A is asking questions. This is what uh, I, our teachers probably don't do enough of. This is the kind of stuff that gets pushed by the wayside. We, we ask students, we want them to ask questions they don't necessarily know the answer to. And maybe we don't even answer the questions, but it gets them thinking. It gets them thinking deep about topics that they might not, you know, they, they want to know. Why is the sky blue? You know, they need to know. Think about that. And then it's, it's not the end. It's the beginning of the journey. The E stands for exploring concepts. And this is going to be where students get engaged in the learning. This is where they get some hands-on type of activities that they get, they to, get play to play with. with. And they get to explore those concepts. And uh, it's kind of a guided discovery piece. I stands for instructing That's concepts. This is the meat and potatoes uh, of the lesson. This is what you want your students to know at the end. This is slope or friction or whatever it is that you're trying to get done. So this is what you need them to have at the end. O is the organizing of the learning. Lots of times that's graphs, charts, it's data. You compile information. They collect the knowledge that they have learned and then they can present it back to you in a format that is recognizable before you get to the U, which is that understanding learning, which is your assessment. These lessons are interesting to write. They're hard to write because they're very different than what teachers have been doing in the past. However, once they get them written, uh, teachers are finding they're far more engaging for students and they, uh, students like to go through the process. The students like those lessons. There are two websites that Dan referenced, and if you want to get these websites as a link, just send me an email. The first one uh, is a place where all the lessons are listed as single standalone lessons. You are going to have a CD when you're done with 250 of these lessons on it. There will be another 100 or so lessons come through this summer that will get posted. So the lessons are all posted here on this website, which is hosted at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And uh, here are our STEM components, science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you click on science, for instance, you can scroll down through here, and these are all lessons that are related to one of the three projects in the AEIOU format. For instance, we label them over here industry. These will have a direct business connection to one of the businesses in Project Shine in, in Columbus, Nebraska. Energy are going to be related to solar energy projects. They will have some solar energy component and robotics lessons were directly created in conjunction with the SPIRIT grant at the University of Nebraska and the University of, of Nebraska-Lincoln in Omaha. So they will all have a robotics component. If you're interested, the pieces at the bottom down here, these are the I components that have been written that you can write your lessons around. There are some evaluating questions, which are standardized questions taken from um, released standardized tests that have been validated 
that teachers can give to students after they're done to see if they meet that particular standard or that idea. So those are all here. That's one of the websites. The other website could be found two ways. You can either just type it in or there's this interactive database prototype. And when you click on it, you get a website that looks like this. Now the interesting idea about these lessons are they're modular. The A is a standalone component. The E does not rely on the A. So they're standalone activities. If you uh, are like any other teacher, like me or any other teacher that you ask about, how many times have you ever taken a lesson plan from the internet, downloaded it, and used it verbatim in your classroom? I never have. And these lessons are not designed to do that. You can choose to go through here and look at topics. Suppose that we want to look at a math concept and uh, we want to look at distance, rate, and time. There are nine lessons written related to distance, rate, and time. You can click on lesson here and slowly it will come up and you will see those nine lessons. The internet is slow today. And what will happen is you'll see those lessons and you will be able to look at the A component from each lesson. You may want to use the A component from uh, the UPS experiment. So you could click on this A component. And this A component happens to look about uh, discussing the UPS initiative which is the fact that they do right turns all the time instead of left turns, as I've added this, because left turns take more time. It's, it's more efficient to travel further and always take right turns. So suppose that you like this particular A. You can put this A over here, and uh, then you look at this E. And this E... Um, they design a constructed delivery route, um, but this doesn't really do it for me. So I don't want that E. I'm going to come down here and look at uh, Robo Ruler and look at its E. And oh, this has got a lot of measurement in it. So you're going to use a measurement uh, around the tire to find circumference. So I really want my kids to do some measurement things, so I decide that I want to use this E. The A from the UPS experiment does not rely on the E for the robo ruler. You can use both of these. And then you take your I. Uh, now all of these I's are the same. You can drag it over here. I can take the evaluating questions. Uh, i got to click on it. And uh, I'll just show you what those look like quickly. So there are, uh, these were from uh, the Department of Education in Massachusetts. Um, this was a grade 10 question for distance rate time. There's a grade 5 question. So these are those standardized questions. You can drag that over here. Eventually what you can do is you can click on this and it will give you a PDF document that you can download and use in your, in your classroom. And again, it's a very different format. You have three unique activities, one of them designed to get kids asking questions, one of them is designed to explore the concepts, explore the learning, and one of them is designed to organize the learning, to put together what they've done. What we're going to do now is to kind of give you three little different lessons. And LIS in the back is going to work on a lesson uh, developed from Kawasaki and how they move uh, large equipment using uh, pneumatics. And so I'm going to turn it over to Liz. I'll walk the microphone back there. And uh, I think she wants you to kind of gather around and you're going to get to play a little bit uh, with that concept. Hands on, Liz point on. Yeah, for the next hour or so, we're going to be working on some hands on activities. All right, well, um, 
I designed this lesson uh, for physics is what it's designed for. And it was from going, going to a business. And I'm going to kind of give you just a really quick feel for um, this lesson format, the AEIOU, as I go through it. So um, actually, I'm going to start with the E, which would be the exploring part. And I would start with my students, and I'd say, OK, you have a textbook. All right, so I want you to go ahead and move it across your desk, all right? And I'm going to ask them you know, the question of, so is it easy for it to move? And they'll probably say yes. And I'm like, but is there anything opposing the motion? And they're going to hopefully say what? Friction. Friction. And, and by the way, I ask lots of questions. I try to get you guys engaged. OK. So and then I'll ask them, OK, is there any way that I can make it easier to move this book across your desk? What could I do? Or what could you do? OK, put some rollers on it. So good, you saw the pencils, hopefully. My kids pick up on that usually. So we'll put some rollers here. And I kind of spread them out just a bit. All right, so now we're going to roll this. Now, the first type was actually called sliding friction. This is rolling friction. It's really exciting, OK? Now, th there is another way that possibly I could move this across. Now, this one's a little harder, so I might have to give you a hint, but I'll let you think for a little bit. OK, something to make it slippery. Or um, the hint I usually have to give my students is if you've ever watched Star Wars and they have Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Chewbacca, and they're about ready to shove them off the ship into this gigantic mouth of the sand monster. Do you, know what I'm, do you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but that the ship is, do you know how the ship is moving? Yeah, it's kind of gliding. It's like a hovercraft type thing. All right, great. Yeah. So you could imagine we could have a hovercraft type thing. All right. Now, that's called fluid friction, so either um, a gas or a liquid. All right? So we've got those three types of friction. All right? So then I'm going to move on to the, my, my A component, which I might have started off with first. And this might be hard for me to talk into the mic. And so <laughs> I, I, on this table? OK, I just want to check with you. All right. I'll, I'll let me I'll, let me ask my question, and um, <laughs> you might laugh at this question. So, how many people does it take to move a semi truck trailer without a cab to drive it away? And it's empty. It's an empty semi truck trailer. How many people do you think it takes? A semi truck trailer. You can just make a guess. It's okay. Four is what I heard. Do I hear something else? Ten. Twenty. <laughs> 20? Fifteen. You're saying one? <laughs> OK. Well, you're going to watch a video, and the answer is going to be two. And I hope this web. There we go. Now, this is not the very prettiest video. I got it off of um, a website. But let me try to get back real quick. This is how Kawasaki moves its $5 million individual rail cars that are going to go to the DC Metro or New York subway or something. So I'm sorry if you can kind of see. Um, there isn't a lot of sound to this, but if you're watching, they're going to be putting air pallets, those are called air bladders, underneath the semi truck trailer. And if you watch here in a little bit, they're going to be moving it just by gliding it across the floor. And this is pure pneumatic. devices, which are very <coughs> tech and inexpensive, <laughs> these CD devices. Um, before we get to that part, which is going to be um, more the O, which is kind of the self-practice, and I'm not using the mic, am I? Um, let me kind of show you a little bit of the physics behind it. And if you're not into physics, I'm going to try to make this, this easy for you, OK? All right, I'm going to have to sit this down, though. Um, we use this 
formula. It's going to be the force of friction is equal to, and this is going to be mu, it's like weak symbol, uh, which stands for the coefficient of friction times the force normal. Okay, let's start off first with the force normal. Does anyone know what the normal is for? Anything that falls below zero perpendicular to the surface. Okay, yeah, it has to do with surface. Okay, now I'm going to put that, because I've also taught at seventh grade level, so I'm going to put that in seventh grade level language. So if you don't know physics, you won't hopefully feel overwhelmed. So when we talk about forces, we talk about equilibrium. So right now, notice my hands are in one location. If one force is greater than the other, it moves. Okay, it's going to come on its side. All right. Um, when we talk about the normal force, it's like us actually right now. You're doing a great example of it. You've got the force of weight, which is pushing down, but you're not going through the floor because the floor is pushing up. Okay, that's known as the normal force. All right. So you have a surface that's pushing against weight. All right. Great. Um, and then we have what's called the coefficient of friction, which is basically um, a ratio of percentage. So let me show you how this works. Let's say that we have an object that has a force of weight of 100 pounds. Okay? And let's say it has a coefficient. That surface has a ratio of 0 0.5. Okay? So that means in order to keep this object moving, I'm going to have about 50 pounds of force I'm going to have. Now, what if I can get my coefficient down to 0 0.1? What's going to be my force over here? 10 pounds. Oh, 10 pounds. Right. Great. Okay. Now, what if I could get it down to 0 0.01? 1 pound. So for every 100 pounds, I'm going to exert 1 pound. But they're trying to see which one's going to get to the least amount, since it's the least amount of force. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, so you guys went through the I part. This would be the instructing. Now we're going to start talking about the O. Okay. Um, so the O would be the lab component. I'm just going to move this. All right, so the basic what you, you see in the back says my students would measure the force of weight of these, which would tell them the normal force. Okay, because the only difference is direction. One goes down, one goes then the other thing that they would have to do is come up with the force of friction. And so we have these handy-dandy spring scales. Um, and these, they would have to convert because it's in grams. But these are the smallest that I could get that would work for this. And when you put them on their side, they don't work as well. They don't quite start at zero. So I tell them to add about 0.5, okay? Keep in mind, I want my kids to have the experience at this point, not necessarily always the accuracy. So what I would have them do is they're going to clip on to the CD, and then they're going to drag it, and then they're going to measure, okay? And you guys are going to do this in just a little bit. So all you have to look at is, is it harder to drag or not? That's, that's all you're required to be able to do, okay? So I give them um, three different surfaces. So I have just a, a smooth surface. This actually has some little beads, so we're looking at rolling, okay? So this is sliding, rolling. And then back here, and I'm going to have to ask you to move. I'm sorry, but you might have to move a little bit this way. <laughs> um, we're going to add some fluid to it. So I've got a balloon, and um, I have this. I'm probably going to not show it per se, but it's to hold up the balloon because the balloon will flop over. I'm sorry, I'm not good with got the cameras. Because the balloon will flop over, and then that'll you know hinder the results. Okay, but we're going to just see it without the balloon, and you can you can have it twisted, and then eventually release the air, or you can just pull up the top. Okay, and then let them glide across. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys play, but before we do that, I have three questions I'm going to ask because my lab, I ask my students these three things. So when you go in and do this, which surface is better? Is it going to be the sliding, the rolling, or when we add the air to it? Okay, you probably can guess. But I'm going to let you play. All right, the next thing that my students have to tell me is which is better, a smaller size one or a larger size one, okay? You could probably tell me, but I'm going to let you play. All right, the last one's a little harder, and this is the one that I think um, the most growth came from me, okay, when I saw this. Now, this one has one hole that it releases air, and this one has four holes at the bottom that release air. So which is better, four or one? And can you tell me why? All right, so I'm going to let you go ahead and play. I don't care where you start or how you do this. 
Um, I have one here and here just to, to go across and then the beads and then the balloon. I don't want the balloon back, just, just so you know. <laughs> you can throw it away, that's great. Um, and then I'm gonna ask those three questions and see what you guys learned. So go ahead and grab a CD device and you can grab a spring scale and go ahead and play. I, I think you're okay. Uh, we didn't realize that there was going to be a camera when we started, so um, I didn't set up unfortunately for that. So. Would I have to grab it? Use the scale top. You can just put it over here because this you want to. You want it? You're gonna have to drag it here, unfortunately. So, and it's it's okay. I I guess I want my kids to have the experience. Which one uh, will move more yeah. easily yeah. and why? With the balloon. Um, With you know, the balloon, I always tell them to click here, but it, 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 it might be okay if you flip there. I haven't tested it that way. And like I said, I want my kids to get the experience, so sometimes I don't. Other things I'm more you know, precise and accurate with this. It's, 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 it's not kind of right. Yeah. And then, you know, how are we doing that? You're doing great. You just take how much time you want. I'll be fine. 
This is very fun. Not it is. Is. <laughs> and we get great concepts out of it as well. I know. Do we have to time. go over the no, just, just over it. You can put the toilet paper rolls on there if you want to. They're just kind of a little bit of a frog. Yeah, actually, I think they're okay. I just don't know. Oh, yeah, and if it doesn't have much. Yeah, oh, it's very small. And sometimes it's because, see, this device really shoots. No, I got one over here. And so I'm going to see if I can try to find some little forwards and just pull it across. You know? Or, and then I say, well, at 0.5. But, like I said, I know it's not as accurate, but that's not always. All right, I'll probably give you what I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> I'll probably give you about another minute, minute and a half, maybe, and then, and if you're if you're ready, we'll just go ahead and discuss. So. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and discuss. Yeah. So, uh, those of you who participated, you kind of just would still kind of stand around what? here. <laughs> so, I can ask some questions and we'll go from there. Um, all right, so which surface was better? Was it this one? Was it the beads or was it over here? Oh, this one. The beads. The beads is better. Some of you are saying the beads. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And sometimes we run into that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've switched it to sand and then that didn't work as well because they started. CD went down into the sand, but um, hopefully at least one of them over there will be the air. But because these beads are pretty tiny and they're right there, sometimes they work better. I will agree with you. Okay, and that's just a kink I have to work out. But also I use it as an opportunity as a learning tool for my kids, because I'll say, well, these beads could represent wheels in industry, but are these wheels going to be as easy as the air? Okay. All right. Um, the other thing is, oh, was uh, smaller better than larger? Larger was better? <laughs> okay, we need to compare it. Okay. Which one do you think? Larger. Larger. The way you spread out things. Smaller. Smaller. You're going to say, actually, because of the weight, this is hopefully going to go better. Honestly, because of weight. Oh. All right, um, and I can see when we talk about fluid friction, surface area is a component um, that is a part of it, which I would go ahead and talk about because when people jump out of planes, they want to have lots of surface area. They want to slow down, right? So I see what you're saying, and I agree with you in that sense. But really, we're, we're looking for hopefully weight, and that's why I, I debrief labs with mm -hmm. my kids because they don't always see what I think mm -hmm. that they're going to see. You actually go through and do the mathematical calculations based on. Yep. yep, in fact, they have several charts that they fill in, and um, this lesson is on the website and is on your, um, your CD, I think it's called the CD slide. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the name, and that's the only one that I remember, so I think it's CD slide is what it is. But you can go on there, and the way my labs are set up is you can, it has all the questions, it has all the answers, and you can delete the answers, and you can just print off mm -hmm. the questions, or you can rearrange it, however. Um, then my other question, because we did the surfaces, we did the size is, and which one's better, the one hole or the four hole? Somebody said four? You guess four? Okay, it is the four, but does it, can you tell me why? More air. More air goes through. Yeah, that was my assumption. That is it, and that was what surprised me. They use, because um, I thought, well, they want lots of pressure. They don't want lots of pressure, they need lots of air particles underneath that surface. So I talked to my kids about it. it's like 
having multiple little tiny ants carry you than one really big strong ant, okay? And so it's interesting, they just use 32 PSI for this, but they have a hose that's much larger because they're trying to get as much air as possible on an ant. So, well, I am done with my lesson, and you guys have been a great audience. I really appreciate your participation, so thank you so much. Paul is going to take Actually, you. Actually, Brian decided he'd go because he's afraid I was going to take all of his time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, thank you so much. Please imagine. Seventh grade? Is that, I'm sorry. Oh, I actually, because of the calculations, I do do it with my uh, physics okay. students, but I could gear it down to seventh grade okay. because we would just be talking about sliding, rolling, and fluid friction. I could just do it that way. Too. But you would do it at high school level also? I have been, yep. So they can get those calculations. They can calculate the coefficient of friction and then make those comparisons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long do you think of this lesson? Um, I have an 80 minute class period. And so that's what I plan for. I think you could probably get it done in 60 minutes, but because I have multiple uh, calculations, I have to do some kind of takes them the So with the intro, with the lab, with the student, I don't think it's going to be. Well, like the instruction, I would go quicker this time. I would do it So total about 120, 80, 60, 160? Yeah, I would probably give any point instruction one day and should be about the beginning of English, but I would need all day. So roughly about a hundred uh, questions. Yes, yeah. but you probably would Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like you to come up here. Um, I'm going to do a little bit different. Uh, go ahead and come on up here. Uh, sit in these few chairs on here. This is a lesson that's not on the website yet. It was just developed by a teacher. And it is, it is uh, kind of a different lesson, a different application that you might see. Um, it's actually on waves. And one of the things that we do with our eye components, and I've put a lesson up here that you can take a look at. This is what the teacher uh, fills out. Here's what the A is, and this is we're going to investigate vibration sounds and sound waves. And then we're going to do a little exploratory activity, or a little question activity that I'm going to do with you right now. And then the E, um, you're going to get to do this. Uh, we get to make some homemade instruments, because homemade instruments have sound waves. And so why does the sound wave change when you do some stuff? So I went to Walgreens and what the airport let me bring, I, I have laying on the table. You know, I, you, but you can do this with paper towel rolls and you can have all, you kinds, can have of all kinds of things. Um, the eye activity or here, there's Lots different ways different. that you want to look at concepts. And Liss, I think, was taking the, the friction to the mathematical aspect of it. Because, I mean, she's actually having the kids calculate it. But when you look at a lot of these eyes, sometimes there's recognizable or conceptual, mathematical. Um, this lesson is actually applicable. I mean, so what's an application of sound, of waves? sound waves? And the application of sound waves, I'm going to let you, we'll, we'll take a look at here in a minute. Um, but so the first part that you do is you'd start out your asking your activity. And what she's done is she's taken a, a ruler, just like this, a ruler. And she, and sets, she it sets it on the table, and she does this. And, and, and then, why does it make noise? Why is it lower here than here? And, and, they, and kids talk about vibration, but you know, this is a lesson that's designed for middle school or high school kids, and you have to get them, why is there, you know, that, that's, that's a vibration. Well, what is a vibration? Why does a vibration happen? Why do we hear that sound? It's just tearing up the air. And it's hit, okay, so this is hitting in the air. It's making the air move to generate a vibration. Well, what does that look like? If you have to think about it, if you had to put a shape to it, what does the sound vibration look like? Like it's inside of a drum. Inside of a drum. 
Okay, any other thoughts? It's a wave. Yeah, I mean, some, kind of, some kid's going to know that. They're going to say, well, it's a sound wave. We've all heard of sound waves. And so you get them started thinking about waves. Well, sound waves are everywhere. You hear them all the time. You hear them at a rock concert. You hear them, you know, sometimes they're pleasurable sound waves. Sometimes they're not. Some for times for adults, they're not pleasurable. And for students, they are. But, you know, there's all kinds of things out there. So that's the beginning asking. And she's just having them with just a ruler, get them to think about what is that? Think about it. Well, so can you change sound waves? What do they do? Are they, you know, what is the value of sound waves? Can we use them in other ways? Then the E part, she gives them you know, a comb. There's a piece of tissue paper. There's balloons. There's rubber bands. There's all kinds of things here. Just play with it for a while. And she wants you to make some homemade instruments. And uh, she has a little chart here that's filled out that talks about, can you change the sound of your These instrument? Questions that she's wanting them to do. Well, what is sound, how, through what does sound travel? That brings up a whole different thought. So, I mean, can, and maybe you could have a, a, a tub of water that you could maybe use. Does sound travel through water? And you could do, you know, you could do some of these exploring type of activities. Uh, is there comparisons between vibration and sound? What other materials can you use? And she has a chart here that she has kids fill out. And they, they take, they take the material, and it could be the comb and the tissue paper, and, and see if you make some sounds for me. I want to hear sounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I got balloons here. They're Nebraska Go Big Red balloons. <laughs> no, they're not. They, <laughs> I had to get that in, didn't I? <laughs> That's neat, yes. <laughs> I'm a graduate from UNL, so you know we're in the Big Ten now, so we're excited about football. But so you're going to have to, in here, uh, you make some sounds, and she's going to have these kids play with it. Change it. How do you make the sound change? Why does the sound change if you do that? Okay, and so you change the density of the object. Does that change the sound? And there's lots of objects. There was one. I hadn't thought about that, just, just running down the comb like that. And there's a big change in the sound wave coming down that. Well, why does it do that? And you can put the tissue paper on it, and you know you can do the harmonica kind of sound, you know, with some kids. And they're going to have a lot of fun, but there's going to be a lot of really good thoughts generated here about how sound works. Why is a sound high pitched? Why is it low pitched? And you can squeeze the balloons and let with uh, with uh, the mouth of it, whatever it's called, and you, you, know, you can do that. <laughs> and and the, she's going to have you describe the evidence of the vibration and the, and the description of the sound. How do you know it's a vibration? Do you have to have a vibration to have a sound? These are questions that the kids will explore and take a look at. Then she'll get into that I piece, which in this lesson is really about applicable, and then her business tie. Her business was BD Medical which is a, a large medical pharmaceutical company in Columbus, Nebraska. 70% of the medical grade needles used in the world are made in Columbus, Nebraska. And they happen to use ultrasonic cleaners in their process to get things clean. Ultrasonic, those waves that are generated. So she actually goes to a website uh, that I have pulled up here, hopefully. I don't know where it's at. She goes to a website. This is what they actually use. They use GenFab ultrasonic cleaners, and she has them look at what the ultrasonic cleaner is. And there are many different types of ultrasonic cleaners, and she has them kind of ex look at and research how does an ultrasonic cleaner work. And the interesting thing was we were talking about this lesson yesterday, just kicking it around, and you can make an ultrasonic cleaner really, really inexpensively. And this was Paul's idea. You buy a fish pump, and you put a bucket of water and run the fish pump in the water, and the vibrations of that percolating in the water will clean. It's an ultrasonic. Actually, just you set it on top. You set, you set it on top, the wave. And that will let it clean. So you could do that. What she has them doing, actually, which I think is really cool, she has them in the exploring activity do a lab with jewelry cleaning. 
they do three different comparisons. They compare jewelry cleaning cloth, so you get your cloth out and you just wipe it, you know, just buff it. Then you do a solution, so you dip the rings, and then you also have an ultrasonic cleaning system. I didn't bring one with me because I didn't want to bring the mess. And she has them do those to some jewelry, and then she has a chart here to organize everything that they learn. So what is the difference? Is it a little cleaner? And, and which one is going to be the best? The ultrasonic is going to be the best. Well, why? And isn't that a cool application of waves? And so this is a lesson that came directly from business. Kids can see the use of waves. A business uses them. A real world company uses them. And then you can actually do it in class and see that a lab, in a lab experiment, that waves really are applicable and work. So this is another uh, example. And I just thought I would kind of show you the lesson as teachers fill it out. And then she's got her assessments here um, that she's got in here. There are questions that she has, and there's some writing prompts. There's, there's the vocabulary that she wants the kids to get in there, frequency, wavelength, wave speed, you know, pitch. And, and so she's got all of this. So this is what the teachers fill out. And this is a, an example of a lesson that I think has a great business tie and is a hook for kids. I mean, they'll see that relationship. Yeah, people really do do this stuff. Yes. I mean, this. Tracy is a science teacher, and so she will use this in her physics classroom this year. And she got this experience, this idea, from going to a business as part of Project Shine. So she saw this application, and she said, I can take that from the business and incorporate it in my classroom and show kids that it really does work. That's the way these lessons are all designed. They're designed, designed from, that, from that business standpoint to get that included in the classroom or to include the robot which Paul is going to show you now. Um, this is a robot that was designed uh, by a junior and senior college level engineering student. They designed it. Originally. Originally. They got the platform and uh, it's been tweaked several times. Right, originally it had, it had shock absorbers and it had uh, all kinds of motors on it. You know, the things that you would expect from a, a uh, student, in a, a graduate student, this undergrad, who likes to spend his money at Hobby Town. <laughs> and so um, I'll talk, you go ahead, you can plug that in, Brian, and I'll talk about the robot for a moment or two. We're going to have you program the robots. One of the things that, that we, when we originally developed this platform was we wanted a robot that was going to be inexpensive. Because how many of you use um, any of the, uh, you know, First Lego or any of the other kind of robotic systems? Well, they're really, really expensive. And we wanted something that eventually students could get and put together for around $100. And my wife had her fifth graders get these robots unassembled, solder the pieces together, put everything together, build them. This year, she's going to do the very same thing. And what she's going to be doing is we're going to give them the motors, the board, and have them build everything else out of scrap stuff. So um, anyway, it's a robotic platform. Well, Brian's getting me cranked up here. Um, the first couple of years that we used this robot, um, there were two ways to control it. One was to put it in what's called bump mode, where you just turn it on, and it's got sensors on it that sense and turn. Or uh, you could put you know, the PlayStation uh, controller that could control it, which didn't make it much more than a, than a remote control car. And so we decided we really had to have ways for kids to program the robots. So we're developing lessons right now. This, this past year, we actually have um, three ways now that, that kids can program this robot. For the young kids, we have a, um, a, a program that's called SceneBot Commander. That's what we're going to use here. It's a real simple graphical interface. Based it's on based C. On. The other way, there's two other ways. One other way, uh, kids can use um, a TI graphing calculator and write the whole program in TI Basic and tape it onto the robot, plug it in, and it will execute that program. And then, uh, really, the more advanced the high school kids can actually write their, their program in code. Well, this past, yes. The which? The robot. Robots? I don't know. I don't know what that robot is. It's a little bit smaller than that. It has uh, different types of sensors and you can swap out the wheels for actual legs. And oh, it's, no, it's we can't put legs on. It's about 100 bucks for that kit, too, but there are these and different types of programs. I just wonder if yeah. it's just a sample. 
Um, I'm not certain, because this was actually developed in, in house at the university. I'm in college education. The engineering people built this one. And my job is to find ways that we can get it to, to work with kids. So anyway, I was going to say, um, what's really nice is, nice is the, the kids uh, can build their own pieces. We had a, a programming contest this summer, a statewide contest. And one of, a high school group got together. And we had an autonomous course that the, that the kids had to go through. And um, one of the boys, this is a high school boy, senior, he actually got a full, full ride to an engineering school. Um, there's, another, there's a couple ways to interface stuff. And you, I don't know if you noticed, there's a breadboard on here so you can actually create your own parts. Well, what he did was he wrote a little loop in a C program that, uh, and, and put two photo cells on here. And so what the loop did was it checked the input on the photo cell. And if it didn't change, then it went straight. If it did change, then one wheel would speed up. So if he, as it was going through the course, if it was getting off course, he would use a laser pointer and hit one of the photo cells and speed up the wheel to get it back on course. So I thought, wow, innovation and creativity, two things we really want our kids to be able to have. And so I'm going to show you briefly how this works. We're going to give you a little bit of time to uh, play with the programming. And did you grab my eight? Oh. The, the way we met right now, I'm going to set this down, is we use an EDR program, or I don't know if any of you do the EDR uh, uh, components, but it's USB, plugs into your computer. This program is called SceneBot Commander. It's really just a drag and drop program. I'll demonstrate it, and I have a course laid out on the floor. We're going to have a computer here, and a computer here. We'll have half the room on this side, and half the room on this side. And what you're going to want to do is get your robot to start here, here, and navigate through the course, come to the end, and turn around and face this way on the, on the point. Now, if you're a fifth grader, that should take you about 10 minutes. <laughs> so we're, so we're going to see, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Normally, this is a, a more like an hour-long activity. But um, sorry, you have to run out of time. But the way it works, you can see here, there's different commands. There's proximity commands, which will allow it to sense something and move around. But we're just going to use. Uh, one or two commands today. But normally, what we would do is use this to teach programming to kids. You know, a lot of times you teach programming, and the kids write a program, it does something on a screen, uh, not so much fun. But with this, you can teach kids to write programs, and how to teach them how to write uh, functions and subroutines, and put all of this stuff together, and it does something that they really, really yeah, that's, really, yeah, that's really great. So, um, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> We're going to show you how, how to, um, all you need to do is this command, you know, how to move. So we're going to grab the move, and you drag it and drop it over here. Ah, now, you want uh, wheel, left wheel to go forward. That would be good. And you want, you're going to give it a speed. Let's give it, oh, it doesn't matter. But you want to keep these two the same. The right wheel, you want to go forward probably about the same. I forget what I had there. 64. 64. All of these here. That's the speed and power. I'm, I'm just going to type them in. Let's do 50 and 50. And then I, I really want to give you time. I'm going to put 50 on all of these. Oops. Yeah, a nice middle of the road number. 50. And 50. Now, um, that's all I need to do. I have a program now. And if I want to, I can compile it. If I'm a high school teacher, I can go over here and actually look at what the C code would look like that would do that. So that's kind of nice. You don't have no C, but you can develop C programs and you can and look at this. I'm going to come back here out of this mode. Oops, here I am back to my, to my graphical interface mode. Now, what I want to do is just take the robot and I'll help you plug this in, but here's a programmer. Um, eventually, eventually, one of the smart students is going to redesign this, and one of the things that they had talked about doing was <coughs> replacing the computer with a, a droid cell phone, an old used droid cell phone. It would have this whole scene about commander on the kids program, clip it on the robot, it would go. No interface needed. And I send this out, put this right here, and it goes out, and it's going to program my robot right now. So, whoops. I got an error here. Let's make sure I got it in. Oh, that would be a good thing if I did that properly. Okay. So now it's sending that uh, program to the robot. 
Now, if you want to turn, you're going to have one wheel go forward, and what do you think the other wheel is going to do? See a lot of problem solving here. Oh, there it goes. It's executing the commands. So let's see, so let's see if how what my robot does. I said to go forward, whatever I told it to go. So I set it down and let it go. Oh my goodness. I might have wanted to go a little bit further. So, here's what I want you to do for a little bit. I've got this computer here. Somebody came up here and set up this computer. I have this computer here. This is Brian, so be careful. He already warned me that if somebody breaks it, I'm in trouble. This is my computer. Please don't break it either. Um, the robots I don't care about. No, I actually do. Um, and so, I'm going to destroy this program. And you'll have a few minutes to go ahead and try to make the robot do something. Okay? We'll have, how many of we have? We have eight people. We six. have six, three here, and three here. Perfect. This is called cooperative learning, so you guys can get together and, and use your heads. When you're ready, you got to plug it in, <laughs> and I will help you get it plugged into the robot. So um, don't everybody go at once. Okay. Oh yeah, switch back to the switch back to the end computer. Okay, all right. So um, um we want to move it. Yes you do. So okay. you and just move, right. just grab the move and drag and drop it over here. Yeah, 
it's on so that scene website you want to go to. It is. It is. It's on that scene You can run one run through on the other scene bot if you'd like to. Two. Wow. And now, I'm really interested in the Swift And I said, so what are you going to do with me? I just wanted to be aware of one of our programs. So if there's anything maybe that you thought we could collaborate on, I'd get more of a From Nebraska. But just the things you toss it out, and I can see that you have a lot of ideas. Okay, everybody. I know we don't. We really don't have too much time left. <laughs> but um, if you could grab your clickers again, I'm gonna kind of go through the last couple things on here fairly quick, uh, because we have no time. And but there were some uh, lessons learned that we we found with these different projects and. Uh, I'm going to kind of hit the highlights, but uh, it takes a long time to develop the instant success with business and industry to develop some of these lessons. And, and the business relationships take a long time to nurture and really follow up and follow up and follow up. Developing the AEIOU lessons doesn't happen overnight. These lessons are, are um, the more thought that goes into them, the more support and collaboration from uh, multiple people. Uh, someone asked me how many folks are involved with developing all these lessons. We have many people that are uh, involved in developing the lessons and we have an editing team that's pretty robust and it's a fairly, fairly thorough process too. Um, 
and, and we have vetting and we have testing and we talk with business and industry and we have, we're going to have, a, in fact, next Monday we're going to have a meeting where the teachers from this summer's externships are going to get together uh, with the 20 people from business and industry are coming into the college and they're going to present their lessons um, in the draft form that they have them right now and they're going to have a little mini expo where they share what they've done um, or what they plan to do in their classroom. Um, the uh, lessons learned that the four STEM disciplines are, can benefit from the integration. Hands-on gets people motivated, both the teachers and the students. I think you guys can kind of see that. It seemed like you guys were, um, some of you are really getting into it. Um, experienced teachers can develop innovative STEM solutions and lessons. That's, um, you know, it's not like a surprise. Uh, synergy can develop between engineers, educators, and businesses to benefit the students. Now I've got some uh, two or three questions here, and I just kind of, if you would take the time to go ahead and, and click on them. I can use this information, and it's again, it's a Likert scale, strongly agree to strongly disagree. The number corresponds. If you would kindly push those numbers and... Everybody had their clicker? If you've pushed one time on a clicker, you can't push another time on it. It'll change to whatever your last answer was. All right. There we go. We're going to go to the next question. Um, good. So 80% of you, um, you know, you can do some quick math. Three of you or four of you, four of you said that you could do that. I will use this information. I will use information from this session. And this is the same number that reported last time, so we'll go on to the next slide. Good. That's encouraging. You know, I'd like to see more people get an opportunity to do this, so maybe we'll try to do another version of this next year at a time when we can get maybe some more folks engaged. I am interested in partnering. partnering. We, always, we always want to uh, look at the teachers we work with, the businesses we work with, the other schools that we work with, colleges, universities, high schools, middle schools as potential partners, um, and, and that's something that um, has helped us build a, a pretty good network of, of editors and lesson contributors and consultants to the project. And looks like there's a couple people that are interested. Whoever it is that's interested, I would like you to uh, to know that uh, the information for these websites is on the CD that you have, with along with there's about 800, it's about 800 or six to 800. I can't remember how many files. I think six or 800 files on here for 240 or 50 lessons. These are completed lessons. These are the ones that have been through the vetting process. They are going to be similar to the format that Brian showed you. There'll be more. There'll be probably another 80 or 100 come through by Thanksgiving or Christmas time. Yeah, we have 59 that are in the editing process right now that I'm aware of, and however many came in this week uh, from Project Shine, and I don't know however many other ones are coming from the Spirit Project, but I'm sure there's some being there, developed there too. The STEM booklet that you have, for those of you that are interested in maybe, maybe more information, Brian gave you his email address, and I have my information, contact information is on the back of this, uh, my email address uh, and phone number. And uh, certainly, I would be happy to uh, talk to you about some things that we do or refer you to the people that, that are really um, designing the idea of the lesson or even the business folks, because uh, different things work for different businesses. And I tell you, it's been trial and error, and we've done it a number of years, and we've been able to build a pretty good rapport. Doug Pauly, um, is, um, he's very well tied in uh, with many other projects in the state. We've done uh, training, uh, in incumbent worker training at, um, with uh, our training and development activities, uh, probably in leadership, uh, safety, uh, industrial maintenance, uh, kind of running a blank here, OSHA, quality, quality computers. 
Uh, we've trained probably 9,000 people from over 230 businesses in Nebraska over the last five years, and and that's in a, like 400 sessions. So we we're pretty well versed on it. We're actually hired by the other community college areas to do that sort of thing. I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you staying a little bit longer. Um, I do uh, appreciate your participation and, and your enthusiasm, and we'll be happy to answer any individual questions afterward. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, have a safe trip home.